many business agility models struggle when scaling. Hey, I'm Andy Clef, and I'm here with my fellow Agile Velocity Transformation coach, Sally Tate. We want to talk over coffee, or in your case, uh, tea, uh, about what we believe is a missing piece in many transformations, how organizations budget. So we've been talking a lot about this quite a lot lately, Andy, about how um, you know, we work in a world that is fast paced, change is happening fast. Um, we want to make decisions quickly. And yet the organizations we're working with are kind of bogged down with these budget processes that have been around for a hundred years. So they're not built to respond quickly. They're not built to um, respond to the expectations of the markets for the employees for change in customer desires and needs. So we need to, we've been kind of looking at what are some of the better ways of doing that? These legacy policies and practices, um, they, they are hard. You and I, we read a book, um, Biarte Bagnes's book, Beyond Budgeting, and he borrowed a quote from Russell Ackoff that I just love. And and when we were doing the book club, we, we repeated it back as one of our favorite quotes. So let me read it aloud. Um, quote, most corporate planning is like a ritual rain dance. It has no effect on the weather, but those who engage in it think it does. Much of the advice and instruction is directed at improving the dancing and not the weather. It's so true. It's so true. Um, and and worse yet, um, as we, we look into these legacy practices, um, they feed an incentive system that does not reward what we're looking for as collective improvement. Um, they tend to, to cement, if not even incentivize unhealthy behavior. And, and so the things that we love about um, agility is the boldness um, and trying new things. But these old systems, um, they perpetuate the past. Um, they they allow people to engage in in lowballing, sandbagging, resource hoarding, um, and and the favorite that frenzied end of year spending. That if you if you don't use your budget, you lose your budget. So it sort of um, makes us all scratch our head. Why do we budget in the first place? Can you remind us, Sally? I've I've lost the purpose behind budgeting. Right? It's it's necessary, right? Yeah, from an yeah. individual point of view and a corporate point of view, but what's the real goal? Well, the main goal is to decide how we're going to spend our money, right? Like how are we going to spend it so that we get the best bang for our buck, so to speak. Um, and so when we think about that, we need to think about, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, so we need to think about how and where we spend the limited amount of time we have, the resources that we have, um, the effort and money um, so that we can maximize our business outcomes. We want to get to those business outcomes. Um, however, there are forces in those decisions that are the way that we make them today that just slow us down and they, they may not be aimed at the right things. Mm -hmm. So in the Beyond Budgeting um, book that we were reading and, and looking at some of the other resources around that, um, it's really, it really can be that game changer. It's thinking about financial agility um, and, you know, how can you build that agility into your financial practices? There were three key practices that emerged um, in that book, and I'd, I'd love to explore them with you today, um, see how well we remember what we read. Um, all, all the elements that you described um, are encapsulated in these three processes, setting targets, making forecasts, and then allocating the budgets. Um, so let's let's talk about them in uh, sequence. Although in the book, um, Bjarte makes a good point that um, if you're going to tackle these things, do them all in parallel. Don't do them in sequence. So even though we're gonna we're gonna talk through them in sequence, keep in mind that it's a cohesive uh, exercise. So the the first part. Um, targets. These are our aspirations, what we want to happen, right? 
um, and and we break it into three components. You set the targets, you set some incentivization or bonus structure for for leading towards them because we are humans. We need rewards. We need the carrots um, as well as a few sticks. And then you set time horizons for those things. Um, and so in in the old way of working, um, there's absolute budgets. You you must hit this number, which leads to lowballing or sandbagging, um, which is not a good practice. And so the idea behind relative targets um, comes out in his book as as a more robust, self-regulating, as well as evergreen. If it's just ten percent increase in this parameter every quarter, every year, set it and go. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. The other part that's been so perverse is the bonus structure. Um, there's a radical concept that um, rather than reward people based on silos, do a shared bonus structure that stimulates collaboration and learning across all units in the in the organization. And I think that's a wonderful um, agile value, right? All, mm -hmm. it, we all learn together. There is no shame in being lesser performing than your target, but there's an opportunity to share with each other um, the challenges and then uh, collaborate uh, and all boats rise together. And then finally, the, the time horizons that are in traditional budgeting tend to be calendar-based, financial market-based, um, and, and yes, that cadence does make some sense, um, but it can be very constraining. It seems to me that it's better to get rid of those old patterns um, because they give you a myoptic phobic focus on end of year, end of quarter shareholder report. Um, but what if we organized around business events, uh, back to school, holiday travel, annual enrollments, depending on your the industry, um, I, I think, the way we set targets could be so much healthier. When, where do OKRs fit in? With OKRs, oh, great question. Um, it depends. Don't we hate that answer? Um, <laughs> when when they're well used, when they're used as they are intended, uh, they become those strategic beacons, um, visions and hypotheses that we set that become of the essential feedback loop um, so that we can inspect and adapt, but there's also traps. Um, good art's law. When a, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And, and so if we are blindly following those things, um, it doesn't mean we've done the best we can. Um, they should be ambitious. Um, they should probably not be tied to the bonus structure because then that becomes perverse. Um, and, and they should translate through the entire organization. We come back to collaboration. Uh, some of the problems that have surfaced with bad uses of OKRs, um, fixed quarterly cadence can be problematic. Um, sometimes um, you can't measure everything that um, needs to be measured, but you can usually get some proxy. Yeah. What's next? That's targeting. Um, so the next one is forecasting. And what's different here in beyond in the, the way that beyond budgeting is described is that forecasting is um, alongside uh, your your targets, and yet it, you separate them. So you have those targets, they're long living. Uh, the forecasts are something that you're going to look at how are we trending? Um, and, you know, similar to a weather forecast, you're going to look at, you know, you might look at more detail, shorter term and less detail, longer term, you know, that in the short term, you might be able to predict how you're, how you're performing and you're spending better. And then when you look further out, maybe not as well. And so the forecasting works in a similar way. Um, it isn't going to impact your targets so much because your targets are going to be kind of those longer living things. 
Um, and so when we're looking at forecasting in this way, uh, it, we wanna use it in a way that we can use that data to make decisions um, and make them at the last possible moment. Um, we might use different types of forecasting. Uh, there's rolling for budgets or rolling forecasting where you look at, like I, like I was saying, like more detail um, in the short term, less detail longer term. Um, you might even do dynamic forecasting where you don't have specific uh, time horizons, but you might look at the market rhythms and or look at specific things that impact your business. So some businesses might have shorter um, shorter horizons because they have to respond within weeks or days to things that happen in a market. Um, and others might have longer horizons because they they don't need to respond as quickly or as often. Um, so the, the forecasting should would be more responsive. Um, it would you would make decisions at the right time, the best possible time for your situation in your context text. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, those are the types of things that you want to think about when you're looking at forecasting. It's not just you know your traditional budget where you've got your target, you've got your forecast, and you're looking at it monthly. And you know, on a specific, you know, it might actually inform each other. These are different things, and separating them gives you a, a more agility in the way you're making your decisions. Yeah, um, we've had internal conversations about different forecasting methodologies, and and one that we're loving, and we won't have time to dive in today, is probabilistic forecasting. So, mm -hmm. so taking historical information from your actual system whether it's team, team of teams, org, portfolio, and using that to say, are we on track? What is the risk um, or probability um, that we're going to be able to achieve what we want? Looking mm -hmm. at cycle time for an individual thing, whether it's a story, a feature, an epic, or throughput to look at uh, multiple items. Um, and so I think that's really powerful combined with a relative target setting and then uh, forecasting and looking at the plan, it, it allows you, uh, as you said, to take meaningful action at the last responsible moment. You're walking mm -hmm. out the door. Um, do we need an umbrella or not? Is it raining? Right. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so that's two out of the three. What's third? So the third as right. allocation, exactly. So in traditional budgeting, you have this bucket of money. You, you know, every you go through these long annual cycles, which actually lasts about two years from the time you kind of decide what it's going to be in July for the next eighteen months, um, and that's your bucket of money for the year. And so, and then everyone gets their bucket, and it's their money, and they spend it however they decide. Sometimes they hoard it, sometimes they share it, and sometimes they have a whole lot at the end. You were mentioning that, oh, I have so much money now, I can just buy a whole bunch of equipment that maybe I didn't need, or or training that maybe was good, but I waited to do it at this late moment. So instead of doing that, the, the spending and the allocation of that money is more dynamic, um, and we optimize it for the, the best things for our organization. So, and as we're spending it, instead of asking things like how much money do I have? And, you know, will I have enough at the end of the year? We ask, is this the, the value, the, the best way I can spend it for value? Um, is, it, uh, is it going to optimize the way that we're running our business? Those types of, th of questions are the things that we're gonna ask instead. Um, some of the things that this leads to is funding products instead of projects. So when we when we fund projects, sometimes we have decided on a long term spend that we may or may not know whether this is going to be valuable. Um, when we fund products, we can build in experimentation and we can make decisions on whether we want to pivot away from something that we learn early on isn't going to bring value to our customers. Um, we may decide to persevere through it and keep going. We're gonna we're gonna invest more into it. But those are easy decisions to make because we don't have to go back and see if there's enough money in the bucket because it's already funded. We funded the product itself. The people are funded. We've got long living teams um, who are aimed at delivering value to it with that product, and we can make decisions as we go along dynamically. I, I love that concept of long living teams because of the the level of collaboration, 
not at the the smallest unit, the team, but the teams of teams, right? Mm -hmm. um, people can come and go. So um, we've also had conversations about stable teams don't mean static, um, but they can respond to needs. But when there's that collaboration and trust and combined with transparency and uh, overall incentives, I, it, it's the power to really unlock innovation uh, across the entire organization. And when you have innovation, it's going to drive customer satisfaction, employee engagement. Uh, it sounds wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we, we talked about these three processes. We've got targets, we've got forecasts, and we've got resource allocation. And rather than doing them sequentially, one after the other, do them in parallel and do them separately. So there are three separate processes. They're ongoing all the time. Um, and we're looking at them through their own lenses at different times. So we separate the purposes of them. And that way we can work on improving performance instead of managing performance, constantly thinking about how do we get better. Well, this has been a great conversation. So our focus has been on budgeting and financing uh, or budget budgets and finance. Um, there are two other critical pieces to business agility that come into play. And that's uh, their, their HR related, people ops, performance evaluation, and the reward systems. Um, maybe that's a topic for another episode, Sally? Yeah, sounds great. Awesome. Let's do it. Well, thanks for joining us today. Subscribe to our channel. You'll get notified when we release our next episode, which may include engaging with HR. Uh, appreciate your feedback. Leave us a reaction on what you thought of this episode. And if you have a topic that you'd like us to explore, let us know via a comment. Thanks, Sally. Good to see you. Andy.